Well, hello, and thank you for joining us for another edition of Q&A with Bishop Gaynor. We're glad you're here. Uh, as a reminder, this is our monthly Q&A show where we sit down with Bishop Gaynor and ask your questions on really any topic related to the Catholic faith. Now, if you do have a question you would like to ask the bishop, you can email it to communications at hbgdiocese.org or just drop us a line in the comment section. So Bishop, thank you for joining us once again to uh, answer some of our listeners and our viewers' questions. You're very welcome, Rachel. I'm happy to be here with you and, and with our viewers. Excellent. Uh, so I know the, the latest talk or the most recent talk has been about the USCCB meeting, which took place uh, towards the end of June. And, and certainly a, a big topic of discussion was this teaching document on the Eucharist. Uh, I know there's been some confusion or maybe some misunderstanding in, in media reports on what exactly this document is meant to do. Uh, can you help clarify that for our viewers? Surely, Rachel, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, it is, as you call it, a teaching document. Um, and it's uh, last November in our meeting, the Committee on Doctrine uh, which is chaired, by the way, now by our own native son and former Bishop of Harrisburg, Bishop Kevin Rhodes. Um, and uh, that committee was tasked with the uh, project of coming up with an outline for a document on the Eucharist. Uh, the working title now is The uh, Mystery of the Eucharist in the Life of the Church. And certainly, I, I hope everyone would understand the importance of, of, of that document. Uh, we're at a time when we see more and more evidence of Catholics who just don't understand the, the Eucharist uh, as the source and summit of our life, Catholics who uh, may even be practicing and coming to Mass, but don't believe in the real presence of our Lord. So th this is a critical time when, when this kind of teaching document is so relevant and so much needed. The document, as is proposed, uh, will have three sections to it. Um, the Eucharist, a mystery to be believed, speaking about the truth of our Catholic teaching on the Eucharist. Uh, the second part will be the Eucharist, a mystery to be celebrated, emphasizing the beauty of our Catholic liturgy. Mm. And finally, the third part, uh, the Eucharist, a mystery to be lived. And in that part, it will be the, the goodness of a life centered in the Eucharist. And it's, it's that part of the document where there is a proposal to have a section on what uh, has been the focus of the media, and, and that is Eucharistic consistency. Um, there may be, in the draft that we'll look at next November in our fall meeting, our plenary session, um, certain um, descriptions of those things that would um, deny, would qualify to deny a, a Catholic in public life from receiving a Holy Communion. That's been typically called now uh, Eucharistic consistency. And you know, it's, it's always been our, our Catholic position that we don't have what in general in Christian terms is called an open uh, communion table. Mm -hmm. uh, there's always been, first of all, the requirement to be in full communion with the Catholic Church. When we say amen to the body of Christ, we're also saying amen to the believing mystical body of Christ. They are inseparable. I, I know I've said uh, before that the Eucharist makes the Church and the Church makes the Eucharist. And so this part of the document is going to say that by sharing regularly, uh, as Catholics ought to, in the mystery of the body and blood of Christ of the Eucharist, it must then be evident in the goodness of our lives, leaving lives that are consistent with the Church's uh, doctrine and moral teaching. And this is, again, nothing new in the Church. You can go back, certainly, to St. Paul in his first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 11. And he speaks there very clearly about uh, he who would take the body and blood of Christ unworthily, eats and drinks a judgment on himself. Mm. So he, he warns the, uh, the Christians in Corinth, in the, the Christian community in Corinth, to discern the body, uh, to be sure that, uh, in, in our terms, you might say that your conscience is clear, that you're in full 
communion, full unity with the church in order to say amen to the Eucharist mm -hmm. and to receive Holy Communion. Justin Martyr, very early in the second century, and the earliest description we have of the Mass outside of the Scriptures, um, speaks very clearly there about uh, people who are not in union with the believing community cannot partake of the body and blood of the Lord. So <clears throat> it, it, it's something that is, is, is uh, part and parcel of our Eucharistic practice through the centuries. Mm -hmm. And we have documents uh, clearly from 2006 in the, from the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith uh, about uh, public officials who defy church teaching, either doctrine or moral teaching, and who should be excluded from receiving because their, their lives uh, and, and the positions that they espouse adamantly, strenuously, publicly, are contrary to the church's teachings. Pope Francis uh, chaired a, a, a meeting, now very famously called the Aparecido meeting, uh, 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 when he was the Archbishop of Buenos Aires. Mm -hmm. And the document that was produced there says exactly the same thing, that um, public officials, and of course he's speaking in the context of, of uh, South America and Latin America, but nevertheless, Catholic public officials who defy church teaching should be excluded from receiving. Mm -hmm. So that is proposed as a part of the third part, a mystery mm -hmm. to be lived, and uh, we'll see how the final text comes, and it, it will again be debated and discussed at our uh, fall meeting this coming November. Okay, thank you, Bishop. Mm -hmm. I'm certain, certain that will help a lot of our, our viewers with, uh, you know, Understanding a little more about sure because the, the only thing we've heard about this is is the focus on uh, whether or not can the church should the church uh, 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 truthfully I think if we, the, the church's preference the, the the canonical preference is that when one knowingly takes these kinds of positions it would be a matter of integrity to exclude oneself rather than look on it as a punishment, uh, beating down some public official, a, a matter of personal good conscience and integrity should tell a man or woman who's serving in public office when they have taken positions totally contrary to their own faith that they're not in harmony with their Catholic Church. Um, and therefore, the preference is that I exclude myself from receiving, just as so many of our Catholic friends who are in an irregular marriage, for instance, mm -hmm. um, they may come to Mass regularly, but until they're able to regularize their civil union as a sacrament, uh, the sacrament of matrimony, they know that they must refrain mm -hmm. from taking Holy Communion. Okay. And that would be certainly the ideal, where, where the Church doesn't have to say, you are excluded but rather a person looks at their own conscience um, and realizes they are not in full communion because of their defiant position and then excludes themselves from taking the body and blood of Christ. Right. That would be the way it should work. Okay, okay. So I kind of want to continue the, the discussion on, on the Eucharist because um, I know there was another discussion at the USCCB about a Eucharistic revival uh, project or, or, or event. Uh, so can you talk to us a, a little bit about that? Surely, uh, uh, gladly. And uh, that, that phrase became a little controversial, Eucharistic revival, and we are using that phrase to describe this effort. Uh, but one of the bishops said, you know, where I come from, that word revival means a preacher comes in, puts up a tent, preaches fire and brimstone, and then leaves town. Uh, we do need, again, as we said earlier, to revive uh, among all of us um, our, our understanding of the Eucharist, our love for our Eucharistic Lord, and our own living out that mystery in our daily lives. And so this is an effort from another committee of the USCCB. It's the Committee on Evangelization and Catechesis. And it's a very ambitious program. It is, it is a three-year program that should begin in the summer of 2022. Mm -hmm. um, the first year, the, beginning in July of 2022 and extending to June of 23, 
would focus on the diocesan revival. And there we would hope during that time to have very, we're called, we used the phrase evangelical catechesis, because it's not just informational, but formational. Uh, we, we, we need all to be formed more deeply in the truth, the beauty, and the goodness of, our, of, of the sacrament of, of, of the Eucharist. And, and so the first year we'll focus at the diocesan level and forming leaders who will be able to facilitate and work for the next year, that would be the summer of 23 until June of 24, uh, at the parish level. So first year diocesan revival, second year uh, uh, parish revival, and then the third year, uh, which would be the summer of 24 until June of 25, would be a National Eucharistic Congress. So all of that, that, that work that's been done locally, uh, that, that, those groups will, will continue, but there will be a focus on a, um, making a pilgrimage to uh, a place somewhere here in our country where that we would hope to have a very, very large gathering uh, of Catholics uh, for a Eucharistic Congress. So it's, a, it's an ambitious three-year program. Uh, the title of it, at least the working title now, is My Flesh for the Life of the World. It comes from the sixth chapter of St. John's Gospel, verse 51, part of the beautiful Bread of Life discourse. And so that would be the title uh, for this uh, three-year program of Eucharistic revival. Excellent, excellent. All right, so another question that, that we had submitted um, also deals with the Eucharist. This one's a little different, though, uh, because this question is, when a Catholic is receiving the Eucharist, what happens if they accidentally drop the Eucharist? Uh, sure. what, what should they do? Um, so uh, I, I think there are two, if, if someone uh, is, let's say, receiving in the hand, or sometimes even uh, uh, on the tongue, um, uh, the, if the host, the sacred host, should fall to the ground, uh, it depends. If it's in the presence of the priest, the deacon, or the extraordinary minister of Holy Communion, it, it may be that the 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 one who uh, offered the host will will pick it up off off the the ground. And typically, what one would do would be to put it in the back in the ciborium, not not to give that directly to that person. Uh, but to put it back in the ciborium. Uh, but if it happens as the person was walking away, uh, then, or even if maybe the minister is, has a difficulty in picking up that host, mm -hmm. then uh, the, the communicant himself or herself can retrieve those, and then they would they should simply consume it. Um, sometimes, uh, uh, because we want to give the utmost reverence Again, emphasizing that a, a too casual of an attitude, um, I think, can diminish or dilute our, our understanding of the real presence of our Lord. And so we, we want to give the Eucharist and our Lord's presence in the Eucharist the utmost, um, not just courtesy, but sort of adoration. And, and so uh, at times a, a, a purificator would be placed on the floor where the sacred host fell. And then there would be an ablution after mass of, of that area, just taking some, uh, you know, a cloth with some water and making sure that no particles of the sacred host have uh, remained there on, on the floor. Um, whether or not that happens, still uh, it, it should reverently retrieve the, the fallen host and then it needs to be consumed. Okay, thank you, thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, so ch completely changing topics now, we did have a question submitted asking, can an Eastern Rite Catholic bishop or patriarch be elected pope, or must it be a man of the Latin Rite? Oh, good. Now, the, 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 the pope, uh, the bishop of Rome, is the universal pastor of the whole church, both the Latin church and all of the, the multiple Eastern churches. Mm -hmm. And so um, a patriarch or uh, a, an archeparch or an eparch, bishops in any of the Eastern churches, are all candidates uh, for the papacy. And we've certainly, in the history of the church, had uh, popes who were from one of the Eastern churches. It hasn't happened for some time, but they are all candidates. When the uh, cardinals go into that conclave um, and begin electing the, the voting process, um, any um, male, baptized male, baptized Catholic male, uh, who's capable of Episcopal ordination could be elected. Uh, I think it's Canon 332. I did check that out, but I think it's Canon 332. Uh, so that if someone's elected who is not a bishop yet, 
they're taken into the conclave, and if they're not a priest, uh, they would be elected. If we, it's often been said, if we had the male equivalent of a Mother Teresa, for instance, that everyone <laughs> recognized it, and, and that just in addition to personal holiness and servanthood, uh, that this person might be a good uh, pope or the, the bishop of the, uh, the supreme uh, bishop of the church, then he would be brought in. He would have to be ordained a deacon one day, a priest the next day, and then a bishop before he became public uh, as as the uh, the new pope. So the truth is, though, that that uh, yes, Eastern uh, bishops are all uh, candidates. Uh, but any um, Catholic baptized male who is capable of receiving the Episcopal office could be, in theory, elected Pope. Very interesting. I didn't yeah. know that. <laughs> All right. So the last question that we have for, for this time around, Bishop, is uh, so this time of year, summer vacations uh, are kind of picking up. People are thinking of going on vacation. Uh, and the question was, that was submitted is, are bishops allowed to take vacation? Are we allowed to take a vacation? I, I, I would say uh, people who work around us uh, are delighted when we take vacation, <laughs> when, the, when, when we're away. And uh, surely, uh, yeah, just humanly, we, we, we too uh, need that time to relax and step outside the, the normal routines mm -hmm. of, of our responsibilities. And so, uh, like a priest, uh, uh, we, we would have four weeks of vacation, which can be taken at any time. can take them together or spread them throughout the year. So I, I, I've never taken that many weeks in a row. I, I, I generally take two weeks at the end of the summer, around Labor Day, for uh, my, my vacation. But, um, I, and I, I, it's often a staycation, not just in COVID times, but I, I jokingly say, but it is true, I've, I've become a destination for others. And, and that's fun. I enjoy having, offering hospitality to friends from my, the, the, the Allentown Diocese uh, and also uh, friends from Kentucky and, and elsewhere, people who, whom I've known over the years and uh, the opportunity to get together. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, I don't have any travel plans myself at this time, but I do have a, a number of guests who are coming uh, during some of my time off. But uh, we are allowed to have, and we're, I think you know, humanly we, 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 we all need to take that time mm -hmm. uh, to get refreshed, rejuvenated, uh, and uh, you know, start fresh then in, in, uh, in our uh, ministries. So we, we, we are allowed, we are encouraged, and I do. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Sure. Well, thank you, Bishop. That's, that's all the questions that we have okay. for this time. Uh, so we do really appreciate your time spent with us and, and certainly your time spent with our viewers. You're, you're most welcome. It's my, my pleasure, and thank you for watching. Well, if you do have a question for Bishop Gaynor that you would like to show up, in our next show, please email it to communications at hbgdiocese.org or send us a line here on our Facebook page. You can drop it in the comment or private message us. From all of us here at the diocese, thank you for watching and we'll see you next time.